Welcome to Building My Legacy Podcast. This podcast is designed for leaders and entrepreneurs who want to leave a legacy and will provide strategies that focus upon key elements for legacy creation, determining your desired impact and its benefit, increasing your legacy's reach by engaging key stakeholders, planning, prioritizing, and executing. Here's your host, Dr. Lois Sonstegard. Welcome everybody to today's Building My Legacy podcast. I have with me today, Stephen Ajay. Did I pronounce that correctly? Okay, Okay, Stephen Ajay. He's a pharmacist. He's located in the UK. He works with between UK and Ghana. He has a company called The Blue Cloud in which he deals with healthcare issues. Um, Coming from his pharmacist background, um, I'm fascinated by that. He also has done work with the NHS. He has just also written a book called Pay the Price, and it's all about entrepreneurship. And so we want to talk a little bit about that. But before we get started, Stephen, tell us a little bit about your background. What got you into doing what you're doing? Thank you, Louise. It, 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 it's fascinating. Uh, but, but before I start, also, I just want to thank you for um, enabling me to be your guest. Um, um, I, I feel really passionate about legacy. And um, I mean, there are lots of podcasts out there, but yours is one of the few podcasts that talk about legacy and leaving a legacy. And I think I think it's very, very um, extremely important. So once again, thank you so much for the opportunity um, to be on, on your podcast. Um, I'm Stephen. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm British Ghanaian. So I was born in the UK. But my parents and my heritage is from Ghana in West Africa. Um, so when we were five years old, when I, when I was five years old, my parents took me back um, to, um, to, um, to 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 Ghana, and I got all my education. I I I, I qualified to be a pharmacist um, in, in Ghana. And then straight after qualification, I had the bug <laughs> um, to come back to the UK. So I left my parents behind in Ghana, uh, and then I came to the UK. And I qualified as a pharmacist in the UK. So I worked with the NHS for a few years. Then, you know, as entrepreneurs, um, and I'm Louis, I'm Louis, you know this, that there's always this little bug in you that's always, always crawling and always itching and always you no know, digging. And I thought I resisted it for four years. I had a love, I was uh, married to a lovely woman, um, Della, had two kids. I thought, this is lovely. Why do I want to, to rock the boats? But they both kept rocking inside of me. And I thought, okay, finally I gave in. And I went to one of the best um, business schools in, in the UK called Warwick, um, got my MBA. Then I launched Blue Cloud. Okay. So, so tell us a little bit. What is Blue Cloud? What does it do? Okay. And who does it serve? Okay. So um, when, I was in, when I was in Africa, uh, when I was in Ghana, I realized that, and I went, particularly when I came to the UK, um, Africa was getting more and more prosperous, um, but the, which was a good thing. But the bad thing about it was a lot of people were beginning to get these so-called Western diseases, you know, so high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, pulmonary diseases, cancer. Um, and so the traditional way of working in, 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 in Africa is that we were used to things like malaria and tuberculosis and stuff. So with the prosperity in Africa, the disease um, was changing. The disease were changing. And so there, there came a need for new kinds of companies to tackle the new disease burden. Um, and so we saw an opportunity, um, Blue Cloud. And so what we did is we, we funded Blue Cloud to be able to incubate small to medium companies that had, that, that had gone past the startup but we're not quite at a finished product. So the idea was to incubate them. And then by living in the UK, I'd built up quite a, a, um, a network of people that could invest. Um, and so, yep, we did that, started doing that real well. And then we started Blue Cloud. Um, but then after two or three years, everything went wrong. Okay. So before we go into what went wrong, tell me, um, do you have an investment fund that you work with or do you get funding as the need arises? Which way? So both. Yeah. So both, both. So 
we we incubate companies and then we we take those companies into funds, um, typically PE funds and angel funds in the US, um, in the UK, and in 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 India and Dubai, who are willing to invest. Um, and we also do what we call market entry. So medicines are quite good medicines can be scarce in Africa. So we also source good medicines from the UK, from the US, and 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 also from from Dubai and India into Africa um, to, to to obviously meet the need. And we also have what we call the, the, the Blue Cloud Healthcare Conference, where every year we showcase good companies. We invite investors from all over the world. Um, our first one was in Cape Town in South Africa. So we invite investors from all over the world to come and meet, and we get entrepreneurs to come and pitch to these investors um, and we did that. Um, we did what, what the first one was in, in, in Cape Town, which was very successful. And then the second one was in was in Nairobi in 2017. But we weren't able to do the, the third one for reasons which I'll tell you about. Okay, so you're just on the front end of that. So tell us before we go on, what went wrong? <laughs> what went wrong? So um, four things went wrong, um, which is what which what which, which is what led, led to the book. So the first thing is we were naive, okay? So because Africa was booming, we thought that, all oh, this would be a ready-made market. It's Everything's going to be okay. It's going to be honky-dory. The, the, fruits, the fruits were just literally falling off the tree. Just had to pick up the fruit and move on. But it wasn't like that. The PE firms in the UK and the US and Dubai and India were not used to investing into smaller companies. And the companies that were in Africa didn't have the, the, the muscle to be able to to imbibe lots and lots of capital. So there was a mismatch between what was needed on the ground in Africa and the finance available in, 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 the, in, in the Western world. So that was the first um, problem. The second problem is that we got duped. Okay, we were naive, we we're fresh out of business school. We did some deals in Angola and some deals down, down below in Africa. We got, got duped because of our naivety and we lost tens and of thousands of pounds. Um, the third thing that went wrong was I, I got really ill. I, I had a sudden car crash because I had a sudden bout of epilepsy, which came from nowhere. So I was driving once, um, and then I had a massive car crash. Um, car was written off, ended up in, in hospital, and I was diagnosed with epilepsy. Um, and the fourth thing is I made some personal bad decisions, uh, both morally, um, which impacted the business. So these four things together meant that for the next 10 years, we had absolutely no income from Blue Cloud and things went down very quickly. Okay, so now you have recovered that with Blue Cloud, correct? And Blue Cloud is a going entity. So it went downhill, but it did not close. Am I correct? No, it didn't close. So it went downhill. We, I, I, we, I nearly, we were that close to bankruptcy. So we had to... Um, we, we spent so much money. We opened an office in Dubai, opened an office in, in, in New York, opened an office in jo- Johannesburg. We spent a lot of money because we, in our minds, the deals had gone through. Um, and these deals were worth um, tens of millions of, of dollars. Um, so when we got duped and things went badly wrong, we still had to pay for these offices that we'd opened. We still had to pay this for the sun costs. So that drove me close to bankruptcy. Um, so we, we, we I had to, luckily for me, uh, like you mentioned before, I'm a pharmacist, so I had to fall back with it, working with the NHS. And that sustained us for that period for about seven to eight to nine years. And finally, Blue Cloud rebounded back in 2021, which is just last year. And that was that was due to another unfortunate incident of me losing my sister suddenly. But that, in a way, was the catalyst that rejuvenated Blue Cloud. I'm sorry to hear that. That's always hard, isn't it? So your book is named Pay the Price. So you talk about hardship. Entrepreneurship is, in a sense, a struggle. So talk a little bit about that. Yes. So the reason why I would pay pay the price was in business school um, and in all the books I'd, 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 I'd read, and I read tons of books, I mean, from Jim Collins to to Eric Rice, to all the books that all entrepreneurs read about, about starting a business. And, and there seemed to be a prescribed formula, okay? Now, they talk about, about hardship, and they talk about 
all that stuff. But when you read the book, it, when you read the books of entrepreneurship that were available then, it seemed to follow a formula. You have the idea, you have the passion, you have the purpose, you put it together, you start the business, the business booms, and they become this great person. And that's what we all expected. When you went to business school, we we're taught about strategy, we we're taught about marketing and all this stuff. So when you when we qualified, we had to start, we all starry eyed. You know, we thought we have the qualifications, we have the experience. And so yeah, we went for it. And so what caught us by surprise was the number of years that it takes a business to to to, to start. And so I talk about a lot about pain and, and uh, the pain that we have to go through as entrepreneurs. And I talk a lot about uh, things like offense, things about things about legacy, about about how to start an ethical business. So all that is in the book, and that's why we call it "Pay the Price." Because before a business gets successful, there's a heavy price to pay, and so many of us fail. I mean, ninety percent of businesses fail within ten years. That's because people aren't willing to pay the price to succeed. Got it. Okay, so paying the price. Now, you also compare entrepreneurship to the periodic table. Yes. Please explain that. That is amazing and interesting. <laughs> okay. So basically, we when we were working in Africa, we realized that we, you, you, we, there are three kinds of partnerships that you can form. Okay. Um, you can form a, a co, you can have a co-founder, which is you and your co-founder. You can have what, so that's what we call the, the co-founding partner. Okay. So now in a periodic table, and and the, the the similarities were stunning to me, um, and and which is why I wrote about in the book. So um, the periodic table started with Mendeleev, the Russian chemist, on the train, and he realized that you have non-metals and metals which come together to form an ionic bond. So there are three kinds of bonds you can form in chemistry: the ionic bond, which is between a metal which has a positive charge, and a non-metal with a negative charge. So sodium and chloride they come together. They form an ionic bond. That bond is formed from an attraction of one. One has one. One doesn't have the other. They come together and they form a bond. That bond is very, very strong. Ionic bonds are very, very strong. And they are very difficult to break. But they can break easily in the right environments. Okay. So with a partner in business, it's the same thing. Okay. So if, if you want to form a co-founding partner, somebody you want to work with for the long haul, it needs to be an ionic bond. You need to have something that the other partner doesn't, that the other person doesn't have. So, for instance, my partner is called Abhinav. Um, he's Indian. He is incredibly organized. He is very good with details. Um, and he and he's very good with tasks. Okay. And he tends to see the, the little the little things that he's doing. I am a big kind of picture kind of guy. I can see the whole picture. I'm very, but I'm very disorganized and I'm not very good with details. So it works. It's like an ionic bond. He has what I have, what I don't have, and I have what he doesn't have. So together, it's a very strong bond. It's an ionic bond. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. It's, it's, it's a great explanation, actually. So I, I appreciate that. <laughs> hey, wonderful. And then you have what what we call the um, the transactional partners. So in entrepreneurship, sometimes you need to partner with people. For a specific period of time, okay. Now those partnerships don't last the whole time. So, for instance, when we go to Africa, we work in many countries in Africa. Okay, so we have partners in those countries that know the markets better than we do. So we have a particular partner in Nigeria, um, for instance, which is which is Africa's biggest economy. So when I go to Nigeria, we we work with this partner in Nigeria all the time in Nigeria. Now, in the periodic table, you have, you have what you call a, um, a polar covalent bond. Okay, it's like water. Water is a typical example. So water is a covalent bond. You come together to share your electrons, but the electrons are not shared equally. Okay, so hydrogen, um, so you have H2O. So hydrogen has a, has a slightly positive charge and oxygen has a slightly negative charge, and they come together to form water. So they share electrons. But it's not, a, it's not an equal sharing. Because you still have some of it positive and some of it negative. In the same way in business as well. So it's what we call a collaborator partner. So you look for a partner that you you want to do a deal with. Okay. Again, the partner has what you don't have in that. So yeah, they have stuff that they, they don't have the knowledge of the markets. You don't have that. But then you are sharing together. 
So it's not a, it's not a completely covalent. It's not completely ionic. It's somewhere in the middle. Did you understand? And those ones are what we call the the collaborator partners. Yeah. And then you have partners where you you just go in for a deal. And those are purely covalent bonds. Okay, like carbon, like plastic. So those bonds are just shared. Okay, so those bonds are just bonds that you need for a particular a particular issue. So say Apple wants to get some some stuff for the iPhone. They go to this partner. Once they get the stuff that they need for the iPhone, it's done. It's finished. And that's it. Okay. And that is where you share things together. You understand? So these are the three kinds of partnerships. And we call them the co-founder partner, the transactional partner, and the collaborator partner. And they are identical to what happens in a, in a periodic table. Yeah. So whenever you go in for a partnership, you need to think, is it going to be a co-founder partner? Is it going to be a collaborator partner or a transactional partner? We make the mistake of when we go into partners, we look at everything as an ionic bond. It's no. Okay, some partnerships are meant to last for a short time. Some are meant to last for a longer time. And some are meant to last forever or for as long as the business is. And so that's how you have to be. I came, I used the ionic, the, the, the periodic table. Got it. So, so when you do that, in each of the places that you are working, in each of the countries, because you have many, you have different kinds of partnerships. Exactly. So yep. also the share of the business in terms of revenue and profits is how is that determined then? Because exactly. so, yeah, you, the kind of partnership should define that, correct? Correctly. And that again comes down to the periodic table in, in the same way. So um, with the co-founder, which is the ionic bond, you are in for, lo for the long haul. Okay. So Abinav and I, we are in for the long haul. It doesn't matter what happens around us. We started the business together. We are in for the long haul. It's built on trust. It's built on, on a relationship. Just like an ionic bond. An ionic bond is built on attraction together. So those ones, are every, everything that happens, we share it together. Okay. For the transactional partners, which is the ones that you, you, you work with, is the deal. So if we went to Nigeria and we met um, our partner in Nigeria, we work on a particular deal. And for that particular deal, you share the profits. Got it. Okay. Just okay. So it's, it's just for that deal. Okay. And then you have a, a collaborator partner. Sometimes you, you, you go for a deal and you need someone to help you to do something, to build a website, to, to do um, some backend stuff. That's just for that transaction. After that transaction, the deal is done. So whenever okay. you're entrepreneur, you go into a partnership, you need to think, what kind of partnership am I going to? Because that determines, which I talk about in the book, the kind of contracts that you need. If you yeah. if for a collaborator partner, it's a contract. The contract must be very, very strong. So that if, if it's broken, everybody knows that we share. And it's the same thing in a, in, a, in a covalent bond. The bonds are very strong, okay? They are, because they are shared bonds. They're very strong, okay? And, and, and those bonds are put together by contracts. Whereas in an ionic bond, the bonds are formed by trust, by relationship. Okay. That doesn't make sense. Yeah, so that's how you use the periodic table to determine the kinds of partnerships that you have in business. Okay. So now I want to just shift for a moment to legacy. Okay. Legacy you see as being incredibly important. Why? Why is it important to you? It's important to me because, um, again, there are four kinds of legacies. Now, we... We always think of a legacy as, I mean, I know you don't, Louis, because you, you have, I've seen some of your podcasts and you, you have you have a wide definition of a legacy. But generally, when you think about a legacy, you think of the person has died or the person has left something behind in the will or the person has done something. But actually, you are leaving a legacy every single day. Yeah. Uh, for me, for instance, the pharmacist, today we did some vaccinations. Okay, um, I've done 200 vaccinations just today. So basically, I take a needle with a vaccine and I put that, that vaccine to somebody's body. Okay, that's a legacy. I've left something of me into someone's body. So, Louis, every time you do your podcast, Louis, you are leaving a legacy. Okay, so each podcast that you do is a legacy you left behind. Those podcasts are going to be there forever and ever. Okay, and so they're legacies. So the reason why I put them to me is that I, I think there are four kinds of legacies um, that anybody could leave. Um, and I've called them in the book. Um, I call them the, the philanthropists, 
that's a different kind of legacy. Um, the the profligates. And I'll give examples of these like uh, a different kind of legacy. Um, the the pathfinder. Um, which is a, um, a different kind of legacy, and then the purists. They all start with peace. There are okay. four different. Things. Okay. Um, to give you, I'll just make it very quickly and very short, so that we don't <laughs> it doesn't become too I, long. I'm, I'm curious. Please. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're curious. Okay. So, if I use people, people that are famous, it's easier to use them, and I use them in the book, and that explains it better. Okay. So, legacy is generally form into two kinds of legacies. There's the power legacy, which is the legacy that you leave as a person. Okay. Okay. So what I call the place legacy. That's the legacy that you leave as a company. Okay. So between those ones, you can have a good legacy or a bad legacy. So I'll give an example. Jimmy Carter. Okay. He fits what I call the philanthropist. Now the philanthropist is someone who, whose legacy is a good, he's good as a person. So Jimmy Carter is a brilliant person. He's done so much good to the, to the Carter Center. But his place legacy as a president wasn't very good. Do you understand? So what made him famous was a president. But he's not, he's not really famous as a president. People think, people think in the US of Jimmy Carter he, as, as a failed pres presidency. It doesn't mean he failed as a president. But it means that he wasn't popular as a president. But he's extremely popular as a person. Very kind. He's done a lot of good, good things in Africa. For uh, for me pet, personally, as a Ghanaian, if it wasn't for Jimmy Carter, we'll probably still be under dictatorship and the military rule. So that's what we call a philanthropist. Then you have what we call a purist, and that's someone like Steve Jobs. Okay, so Steve Jobs' legacy is solely through Apple. Okay, so when you think of Steve Jobs, you don't think of Steve Jobs as a philanthropist. You think of him as somebody who founded Apple as a great company. Okay. Steve Jobs wasn't known for philanthropy. He wasn't known for giving money away. That wasn't his style. His style was he he he, he always said that he built a big company and the shareholders can use the money as they wish. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So he was a what you call a purist. A purist legacy is formed from the company that he builds, and that's it. The third kind of legacy is what we call a profligate. A profligate is someone who's wasted his legacy. He's a he's he's had a bad company and he's led a bad personal life. <laughs> so profligate means wasted, someone who's wasted his life. So Jeffrey Epstein would be an example of a profligate. Okay. He was a bad person, he was a pedophile, a converted criminal, and the company that he founded is now defunct. It's gone, it's gone bust, basically, IEG. So that's a profligate. And the final one, which I call the pathfinder, is the legacy that we should all aspire to, which means that you build a good like a build a, a good company, and you yourself as a person, you're also kind and generous and you're a philanthropist. And that's what we call the pathfinder legacy. And that's what every entrepreneur and every business and every CEO should strive for. A typical example I gave in the book is called someone called Strive Masiwa, who is the, the first black billionaire in the UK. Um, who founded a company called Econets. But if I want to, if I want to make it clear to home, someone like Bill Gates would be a typical example. He's founded Microsoft, which has done fabulously well. Um, we all use Word and PowerPoint and Excel. And he's also done the Bill Gates Foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So that's a philanthropy. So he, he has what you call a pathfinder legacy. So these are the four kinds of legacies that we should leave behind. And so as entrepreneurs, when you start doing your, 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 your business, you are aiming, if you want to be a really ethical entrepreneur, to leave a pathfinder legacy. Not a philanthropist, not a purist, mm -hmm. and definitely not a profligate. <laughs> <laughs> so for you, as you look at your life, what will be your legacy, Stephen? So I'd love to, to so my legacy, um, for, so for, for now, I'm working on being a pathfinder. So I'm trying to be like Bill Gates. I'm trying to be like Stra Stramasiwa. So I did it for me. Obviously, through Blue Cloud, I would like to take lots of medicines to into Africa, make sure we invest into lots and lots of companies in Africa that can change the healthcare system of Africa so that Africans are living healthier, better, and longer lives. But also personally, I would like to think that my, my, my life 
as a person can impact lots of people um, through obviously being a mentor, through writing books, um, and through and and, be, and and like being a philanthropist. My dad, who is still alive now, is a typical example. He's he. I mean, I write about him in my in my in an article, which I just I just published. He was he's a typical pathfinder. He's fed, educated, hundreds of Ghanaian children, and he's also formed a very successful business and a very successful politician. So my legacy, I want my legacy to be my, 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 my dad. I want my legacy to be like Bill Gates. My legacy to be a person that when I die, I've done a good, I've been a good husband, a good father, and a good business person, and also founded a successful business company, business that has given out lots and lots of good jobs and is doing lots for the world. That would be, that would, that would be what I would, I would say. That. And I hope that's for you, you two as well, Louis. <laughs> You know, a lot of times people don't begin to define what they want for a legacy until they're very much at the end of their life. And, exactly. And some people are able to really define it then, and others find themselves really wandering, struggling to know what it is that they're going to leave. So I appreciate exactly. that perspective. And yes. I also appreciate that you put the profligate in there because uh, it's it's one that we often leave out in that discussion of legacy. Stephen, what is it that is important for our audience to know that we haven't talked about yet? Okay. So um, before you go to legacy, you need to build a successful business. So in Pay the Price, I try to address why so many businesses are failing okay and i i looked at my business and i interviewed lots of business people read lots of articles and i realized that actually business forms into three things you have the honeymoon phase the formative phase and the legacy phase we've already talked about the legacy phase the honeymoon phase is where you need to nail down okay so the honeymoon is made up of you as a person, your passion, and your purpose. The, the three P's. Person, passion, purpose. You need to know who you are and what you stand for and what you want to do. You need to know what you want to do. You need to know sure that what you want to do, there's a passion for it. Okay, I talk about that a lot in my book. In, in the, and that's what we call the honeymoon phase. Many, many, many entrepreneurs fail because they don't nail down the honeymoon phase. Because inevitably, after a while, you go into the formative phase where you face pain. If you haven't built your honeymoon phase very well, it is likely that when you get to the formative phase, you will fail. It's like building a house. If your foundations are not strong, if you haven't built the foundations well, and you begin to build the house, it won't stand the test of time. And nature will test every business resolve. It will test everyone's resolve. And only the people that have had a strong foundation will be able to move past into the legacy phase. If you don't build your foundations well, your legacy phase will crumble. The reason why, for me, I think after 10 years, I was still able to stand, was I think that I had my purpose nailed down, I had my passion nailed down. As an ethical entrepreneur, I had my person nailed down. So even when I had to go through a fit and I crashed my car, even when I went bankrupt, even when I didn't have any money for 10 years, even when I made some personal, moral, bad decisions, even through all that, even through the 10 years that I struggled, because I knew my passion, I knew my purpose, I knew my person, I didn't fail. And I was able to sustain the bad times until 10 years later, before the business began to take off, I was able to write the book. So it yeah. is, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Stephen, I think what's interesting is that timeline. We tend to be impatient and think that results should come quickly. Yours is a 10-year period. And I, I think that is often true, but we aren't prepared generally, mentally, yes. for it being a longer-term period. Absolutely, 100%. I definitely agree with that. Um, and I, I think... Um, for for period, I mean, again, I, I talk about pain a lot. Of, a lot about pain, and with pain, I always say that there are four kinds of pain: there's the red flag pain, which is the pain that we do to our self sabotage. Okay, so I had a lot of issues with sexual sins, um, um, and that was my red flag pain. That sabotaged me every time, 
And most entrepreneurs have what you call the red flag pain. They do things to themselves. They sabotage themselves, okay? And then I have what you call the white flag pain. I use white flag because you surrender. White flag is the things that happen to you that are unfair. I had epilepsy, it was unfair. Every entrepreneur has things happen to them that's un- that are unfair. Okay, it's a part of it. It's part of the journey. Okay. And then the, what you were talking about, which is the waiting period, I call the amber flag pain. It's amber because when you get to traffic lights and it's amber, you have to wait. Okay. So that amber flag pain is pain that you it's a waiting pain. And every entrepreneur has to go through it. Some are lucky, they wait for three months, six months, a month, a year, things take off. But the maj- vast majority of entrepreneurs have to wait for years before they get their first real paycheck. And then the final pain is the green flag pain. What is the pain of what people tell us? You're not gonna do well. You're no good. It's not gonna work. Now I call it green flag pain because even though it's painful, you still go. When you you see green, you you keep going. So even though people tell you your your business is no good, you can have your friends, your close friends, your close relatives, people that you've grown up with, tell you this business will fail. Can we see a mentor? The mentor tells you this business will fail, but that's a green flag pain because you keep going. Okay, so those are the four pains that we go through, and most of us either we self sabotage, or we can't wait, or the unfairness of life gets us down, or people talk to us and we give up. So these are the kind of four kinds of pain that we all go through, and for you to get to the legacy phase, which is what your lovely podcast is about. You have to pass through these four kinds of pain. You know, it's I, I appreciate that perspective because it's so true. And legacy is that it's the whipped cream that comes at the end if you've put the, all the pieces in place as you've absolutely. traveled along in life, right? Okay, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. It's it's when we sit back and maybe maybe it's when our children finally grasp what it is that we've done and maybe they never will until they experience something absolutely but it's it's that light bulb that will go off in the minds of people what else have we omitted that we should have discussed our time is almost up so oh yeah no it's been absolutely lovely talking to you um i just love your warmth louise and 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 your authenticity <laughs> so once again i just wanted to thank you for 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 this, for this time um, i've really enjoyed it um and you, you know my first um, hosts, but you're definitely one of my, my best hosts. You just come across as being so warm and, and so caring. And you generally seem interested in, interested in what we have to say. So once again, I just wanted to thank you and say thank you so much. Stephen, um, thank you. Thank you so much for those kind words. <clears throat> and for those of you who are listening today, we will have information about Stephen in the show notes. Please visit um, Amazon. Must carry your your ebook. Is that correct? Yes, yes. So the ebook comes in 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 three forms. Um, it's it it was very very popular. It it hits number one on Amazon in eighteen categories on its first day. So it it's 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 available on Amazon um, as hardcover, paperback, an ebook, and it's amazing. It's 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 it's, it's amazing what happened. But it's it's available. Barnes and Noble, Waterstones, uh, Books a Million, Book Depository. It's available uh, available anywhere books are sold. Okay. So it pay the price. Go pay visit price. Um, any of your favorite book dealers and get a copy of it. And Stephen, thank you so much for your time today, for being with us on Building My Legacy podcast. And for those of you who are with us, Thank you for being with us. And please remember to also visit our website at www.buildtomorrow.com with the number two, and also our new website, which is www.startwithcollaboration. Thank you so much. You've been listening to Building My Legacy podcast with Dr. Lois Sonstegard. To book your appointment with Dr. Sonstegard, visit www.buildtomorrow.com.